Hey, if it's all right with folks here today, what I'd like to be able to do is talk about where the state has been and where we are headed when it comes to wildfire prevention, wildfire response. We'd like to be able to have a discussion about what we're focusing in on when it comes to telecommunications and, of course, utilities, touch on insurance, some very um, non-controversial issues uh, here today. Uh, and then most important, if it's all right with folks, is hearing from each and every one of you. So if it's all right, we're gonna do a little bit of a lightning round of uh, where we're focused right now, where we've been focused, and most importantly, where we're going. Is that all right with everybody? And again, uh, so excited uh, to be with you here today. So bottom line is this for the state of California. Uh, we are hyper-focused on this crisis. Uh, and what we know is that it has to be an all-encompassing approach from all levels of government uh, and non-government entities to be able to protect local communities and keep residents safe. Am I right? Um, and it, it is so critical. So here in the Golden State, we are truly taking comprehensive multi-year action to be able to combat this era of mega fires. We know that we're never going back to the way it was prior uh, to the early 2000s. So what I'd like to touch on are four points here today. Increasing firefighting response and resources, personnel and equipment. Number two, would like to talk about how we're modernizing technology uh, that provide residents and public safety personnel with the tools they need to keep themselves and communities safe, along with mandating the hardening of utilities. Would like to focus on a third point of investing upstream when it comes to the wildfire crisis. And then of course, um, how we need to work, work uh, here on the insurance market. So let's get into wildfire response uh, and what we're doing in regards to prevention. Number one, in the last eight years, CAL FIRE has greatly uh, expanded its ranks. The legislature, the governor has been very intentional on that. If we take a look just eight years ago, CAL FIRE had 6,700 firefighters on the ground every year. Today, this year, we have about 11,500 firefighters on the ground. We have just struck an agreement uh, with Local 2881, who represents CAL FIRE firefighters. We're, re we're reducing hours for the work week, which means we're going to increase the number of firefighters. Additional 1,000 full-time firefighter positions will be brought on uh, over the next 36 months when it comes to CAL FIRE. CAL FIRE is by far the largest stateside wildfire response in the United States of America. And I gotta be honest, we owe those women and men a debt of gratitude. They are America's gold standard, uh, and I'm grateful for the work. And if we can please give them a round of applause, my goodness. Um, look, uh, we have treated over 300,000 acres of forest land. We know that there is much more to go. And I'm gonna share a frustration uh, and not being partisan here, no matter if it's been Democrat or Republican administration, we have yet to see the investment of the federal government when it comes to the 57% of forest lands that cover the state that are owned and managed by the federal government. And finally, we have a breakthrough. The Biden administration has announced that they're gonna invest a half billion dollars on the most critical fire threat forest, mostly in Northern California, focus on forests around communities, and in particular in watersheds that are critical a critical to uh, the California aqueduct system that provides uh, drinking water to about 60% of the population here in California. That 500 million is a game changer for us, but we know that needs to continue. Uh, we are greatly expanding our aerial firefighting fleet. We are uh, stripping out all of our Vietnam era Black Hawk helicopters. We have brought in night fighting Black Hawk helicopters. We have a deal with the Coast Guard where we're taking seven C-130 cargo planes off of their hands. We're gonna transition them into the largest fire bombers in the sky here in our aerial fleet. Um, millions have been invested to be able to deploy thousands of wildfire cameras in even the most remote, remote stretches of California so that we get early warning when we see that smoke. And um, 125,000 acres of oak woodlands, grasslands, uh, forests have been treated with prescribed burns. Um, and that is gonna only expand here as we move forward. And we are finally repositioning firefighting resources prior to the event starting. We're spending about 25 million a year to cover overtime for local fire departments, uh, along with stateside fire departments, to be able to get 
uh, those resources into communities that are under fire threat before a fire starts. Can we talk about technology quickly? Is that all right with folks? So look, we have a lot of uh, uh, CEOs who are here, and I want to say thank you uh, for your incredible work that you do on your apps. We, I love it. I uh, have it on my phone even as we speak. So in addition to the deployment of thousands of new firefighters um, and the cameras that we talked about, we are modernizing our entire 911 call system. It's next generation 911 here in the state of California. Uh, every county will have their upgraded 911 system by the end of 2026. Here's what it's gonna allow us to do. You're, uh, if you call in to 911 or if you're a paramedic, police officer or firefighter on scene, you can now text photos or video to provide additional uh, situational awareness to that dispatch center. Number two, all centers are now gonna be backed up in the cloud. Because what we saw in particular during the 2017 firestorm, we had to evacuate 911 call centers. They didn't have the ability to switch over to another county or a local jurisdiction and phones went unanswered. Simply unacceptable, especially uh, in this technology-rich state. So now, after we move towards this next-gen and final implementation of next-gen 911, every call center will be backed up that we can automatically switch over. Three, we are going to have enhanced location tracking ability for callers as well as first responders. And we're finally going to have common alert and warning technology uh, capability in all 58 counties. No matter if you live in Modoc County or in Los Angeles County, you will have the ability to have a common thread when it comes to alert and warning. We now mandate alert and warning training for local emergency managers. Because what we have also found is that during the Tubbs fire, during Paradise, right, um, local emergency managers weren't up on the latest alert and warning technology can no longer happen in this state. We're mandating backup power for critical cell towers and cable infrastructure. 72 hour mandated backup power. I will tell you that has been a fight to get implemented in this state, uh, but the state ultimately won. Uh, and it is absolutely critical because uh, what we've seen fire after fire is that cell towers uh, fiber burn up uh, and there is no backup technology. Um, and now you uh, cell companies, uh, cable companies are now deploying that backup power that has to run for a minimum of 72 hours. And I know we shouldn't have to legislate for this, but we now mandate communication from telecommunication and cable companies within 60 minutes of an outage of a cell or cable infrastructure. So as late as 2015, you could have a massive wildfire in Lake County, and I wanna say thank you to Supervisor Piska for her incredible work in Lake County. Um, she does a fantastic job each and every day. And there is zero communication from AT&T or Frontier or Verizon. They won't tell you if crews were heading out. They won't tell you estimated time of restoration. They wouldn't communicate <clears throat> with the sheriff's office. I'm not trying to pick on them, but just being super candid about it. So now we have legislation that mandates coordination between telecommunication and cable companies if there is an outage within 60 minutes uh, to be able to talk about what the infrastructure problem is, when the crews are going to be there, and how long the outage will last. And you have to be able to provide uh, presence of a true human to be able to have a conversation with our state warning center and local emergency managers. Let's talk about utilities and feel free to throw your chair forward. Um, so look, uh, just going to be honest, um, I have uh, been incredibly frustrated uh, with our local utility here, um, Pacific Gas and Electric. And I'm not going to spend the time here today airing my frustrations. I want to focus because there are quite a few of them. Um, but I wanna to focus today on the improvements that we're looking for and where we're moving. Number one, um, the state is mandating that they have to harden their infrastructure. They're literally decades behind modernizing and hardening their infrastructure. It's simply unacceptable. For too long, they put profits in front of people uh, and that can no longer continue. And this state has to hold them accountable. I'm grateful to the women and men who keep our lights on every day, but just being blunt about it, their corporate office 
has been absent in regards to making their, uh, their utility more wildfire safe. We have now passed legislation that says they have to bury the 10,000 miles of line in the most high fire threat zones underground. And why that's important, 99% of all fire starts are stopped if they're buried underground. And if we take a look at a rate case, what it's gonna cost ratepayers, if PG&E were to continue with their vegetation management program, it would be about 30 bucks per month for the next 10 years for the average ratepayer. If they bury these lines in the 10,000 miles of high fire threat communities, it's about $16.30 per month. So it stops fires before they start and it saves ratepayers money. We also mandate that utilities have to coordinate with local government, emergency managers, if there's gonna be a power shutoff. And uh, the biggest challenge that we've had is working with them to be able to decide if the money is gonna come from the investor side of the utility or the ratepayer side of the utility. And it's absolutely critical uh, that we keep rates as uh, least expensive as possible here in the state. Transitioning to insurance. This is a growing crisis. We've seen this uh, since 2015, actually, the Valley Fire Lake County, and it has only expanded since. And it's now starting to get attention because we're seeing massive non-renewals in Southern California. This has been a crisis that has existed here in Northern California uh, really since 2015. So uh, I'm gonna give you my editorial, my perspective about where I think we need to go. First and foremost, I'm grateful to our insurance commissioner, our governor, who just took uh, decisive action to try to empty out our insurance of last resort called the fair plan. Um, what they just did is uh, in return for candidly higher rates, insurance companies have to empty out the insurance of last resort. You can't get a traditional homeowner policy. You go into the fair plan here in California. It's much more expensive with much less coverage. Uh, they have to empty out 85% of those in the fair plan in return for higher rates. But I'm just going to be super blunt about it. The state of Florida has literally given the insurance industry almost everything that they've wanted. They rolled out the red carpet. They gave them uh, some of the highest rates in the nation, aggressive reinsurance, and private catastrophic modeling. 17 insurance corporations have now pulled out of Florida despite getting almost everything they wanted. I'm not here to bash on insurance corporations here today, but I'm just talking the truth and where I think the state now needs to continue to build is how we keep them in this state. And it's not gonna be uh, because they want what's best for homeowners. They're gonna be looking at the bottom line first. So here's where I think we need to continue to build upon. Number one, we have laws on the books that you have to harden your home. There is no law on the books. If you harden your home, insurance companies have to write. So we believe that there needs to be community hardening plans, community-wide basis, and if a community adopts these hardening plans in connection with the utility, insurance companies have to write. Two, we need to expand low-income homeowner grant program to allow homeowners to afford to do the right thing uh, and harden their home. Three, there is no way in hell that this state should advance private public risk modeling, catastrophic risk modeling, Every homeowner, every resident should know how their home policy is defined and why they may pay more or not. Um, and it won't happen if insurance companies hold all the cards and they have private catastrophic risk modeling. That's simply not acceptable. Four, California has among the most lucrative automobile insurance markets in the entire United States of America. If you write automobile insurance in this state, you have to write homeowners insurance in this state. Again, uh, it's about protecting uh, homeowners as well. The last thing I'm gonna mention is after the fire. So we have learned some really critical lessons over these past many years when it comes to uh, how we rebuild our communities. The number one focus has to be rebuilding communities fast and right. So the state of California has passed monumental legislation that now is going to launch our own community cleanup program. We are developing a list of qualified large contractors to work under Cal Recycle State Department that will advance community-wide debris cleanup programs. Because just being honest, 
We've worked with FEMA, we've worked with the Army Corps of Engineers, and there are some real frustrations there. So the state of California is gonna become one of the first states that will have our own large debris cleanup program with a list of qualified contractors. Those contractors can be dispatched to communities at a moment's notice uh, because they are pre-qualified with the training. Two, we've passed multiple pieces of legislation holding crooked contractors responsible. So what we've seen is we've had crooked contractors come into communities and take advantage of fire survivors and rebuilds. Am I right? So we have extended the statute of limitations where homeowners and attorneys can go after these crooked contractors. We have brought in licensing reform and we've expanded higher penalties for those contractors. And the last thing I'll just say is we have beefed up our Office of Emergency Services. Look, this climate crisis is the crisis of our lifetime. And especially states in the West are faced with incredible challenge. So we have hired hundreds of additional full-time staff at the Office of Emergency Services who now flood communities to help put in the infrastructure to be able to rebuild homes and lives. We desperately needed that, uh, and we have continued with that investment over the past eight years. I'm gonna end it right here and say this. Thank you. So grateful for your leadership, for what you do in your communities, for this state and for the West. Is there a lot more work that California has to do? Hell, yes, there is. We got a lot more work to do to continue to prepare for this crisis that confronts all of us. And we can't take our foot off the pedal. Not now and candidly, not ever. Not in this new reality. This climate crisis is one of the most pressing challenges of our lifetime. And we need to continue to confront it head on. Again, thank you for allowing me to be here. Uh, and um, Jennifer, I think we're gonna open it up for some conversation, uh, for your comments, your criticisms, your concerns. Uh, and again, thank you for your leadership. So let's do it. Let's, uh, let's start the conversation, please. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, I appreciate uh, your attention to this because we all know that this is a problem that's not going away. Uh, my name is Nora Esters. I'm a disaster case manager for River Fire Recovery in Nevada and Placer Counties. Um, I love all everything you just mentioned about prevention and mitigation, but I think we all know in this room it's not if but when a wildfire is going to happen. So I'd like to see more more funding for long term recovery uh, ahead of things happening. So we're not scrambling for funding after something happens. Uh, for instance, River Fire just got lucky and got tacked on to a federal declaration, 4610, with Dixie Fire. Otherwise, we, we wouldn't be sitting here right now. There would not be disaster case managers for River Fire folks. Mosquito Fire, which is in our area as well, not federally declared. We have folks call our 211 service if they say, I'm a River Fire survivor. They get straight to a case manager and get all sorts of services. Mosquito Fire folks call. They can't talk to us. Um, there's no FEMA funding for that. How do we keep our jobs that I feel we're pretty good at and help all disasters, the low attention disasters, the smaller disasters, the undeclared disasters? Where's that funding gonna come from in the future? Uh, I, I've heard it said before that disaster case management is the engine of long-term recovery. Without us having those individual relationships with survivors, you know, how do you know where to, you know, all these donations pour in, how do you know how, who needs what? We know who needs what and where they are. Um, so I'm gonna die on the hill that disaster case management is super vital to long-term recovery, but we're always struggling to find funding for that. We can't rely on FEMA declarations to fund those services. So I'm just curious if that's in the works at the state level as well as far as how are we gonna deal with long-term recovery? Nora, I just want to say thank you, number one, uh, for your commitment, and then two, uh, for being so eloquent uh, on the need for ongoing funding. You're absolutely right. Uh, we're dealing with not a fire, but an earthquake up in Humboldt County. Uh, it didn't get anywhere close to a federal declaration, but we literally have uh, dozens upon dozens of homeowners whose homes slid off their foundation, and they are left to some minor dollars that are coming in from the state uh, and uh, some community benefit. It simply doesn't work. So a state as large as this needs to start thinking uh, about, and we are, by the way, uh, about how we're able to fund 
these lower threshold disasters, but in smaller communities and rural counties, lower threshold disasters are massive disasters for those who are impacted by them, am I right? Uh, and it means everything uh, from being able to stay in your home to rebuild or potentially becoming homeless. And so uh, it is an issue that we're working on. I'm gonna be super straight up with you about some of the challenges that we're working through. Number one, um, as you know, the federal government looks to how much we put in and if we're gonna supplant, they take back. So um, number one, we need to be able to work with the federal government to uh, say that, look, if we're gonna have a non-presidential declared disaster that you're not gonna penalize us, right, in the future for a larger disaster saying if you put in money for this, then you can put money in for that. Just being really open about that, that's an issue that we're continuing to work through with FEMA. Number two, um, my big belief is your budget is your value statement. If you value a strong rebuild and if you value giving homeowners and residents the tools they need to be able to rebuild their lives, then we have to fund it. Um, and that is an issue where I think we should look for some pilot projects, right? Uh, to be able to show how we're able to get these homes back on the tax rolls quicker uh, for that ongoing recovery. So Nora, if it's all right with you, uh, Carrie Lindecker, who is with me today, is gonna give you a card and I'd love to follow up with you uh, to have a further conversation because it is something that we're super passionate about and we desperately need. And more to come on this. And I'm not trying to be squishy with my response to you and give you a non-answer. It's just, we're gonna have, we're working through some issues with the federal government. But uh, Care, if you don't mind just giving uh, Nora, your card. That's great. Hey, good morning. Hi, Lindsay Farrell with Nanotech Materials. What's up, Lindsay? Um, we're coming from Texas. Hot damn. Um, yes, and we're trying to learn as much as we can about fire safety and so that we can share it back with our fellow neighbors. Um, so thank you for, for the education you've provided me this morning. Um, one of the things you mentioned was the community cleanup program, how you've worked through Cal Recycling to train you know, individuals and philanthropies on those programs, are y'all doing something as well in the home hardening space with uh, uh, philanthropies that you're training for specific prevention action um, more at the residential level? Yes and no. Uh, and let me explain that. So um, I'm gonna give you my own perspective and Lindsay, feel free to tell me if you think I'm full of it. Um, so look, we had legislation that actually was gonna be modeled after the state of Florida that would create a home hardening commission. Um, we, it would be with building inspectors, fire marshals, fire chiefs, um, and CAL FIRE that would develop a set of standards for home hardening and expanded resources. The insurance corporations defeated it in the assembly uh, insurance committee. That is a committee that is a graveyard for good consumer-driven bills. I say that because now it's been a bit of a piecemeal approach. So we've adopted, CAL FIRE, Department of Insurance have adopted home hardening rules, regulations that homeowners have to abide by, but it is more of a, uh, it's an underfunded program for low-income residents right now, especially seniors, and we desperately need to be able to beef that up. So we have literally laws on the books, but we don't have the resources to be able to empower homeowners to be able to do the right thing. There was a pilot project up in Paradise, and uh, you all may know, but it was between sixty-five and seventy-five thousand dollars per house to be able to harden their home. Louisiana gives about fifteen thousand uh, dollars to harden a home. I'm sure you're aware of that. That's not going to cut it here in California. Um, so, long story short, we do have a program. It's not nearly as robust as it needs to be. I believe that we need to fund it and insurance companies have to be able to provide either credit off of what the annual policy costs will be or write policy. So um, more to come on that. Uh, it is a bit of an S show, if you know what I mean. Um, and uh, this you can is swear, Mike. It's all, OK. All right. It's, hey, we've hey. been swearing all, all week. It's all right. All, good. all right. So there we go. Uh, and um, this is an issue, actually, that we're going to tackle this coming year um, to be able to empower homeowners. And then, Lindsay, if you don't mind me just asking, how do you do it in Texas? Uh, how are you doing the home hardening? 
And uh, Mike, we have IBHS here too, and Smart Home America in the center. Just as a side note, I'm going to give you your next question, Will. Uh, thanks, Will Abrams. Hey, what's uh, up, Abrams? Senator McGuire, great to great to see you. A really impressive list of accomplishments, and and coming from your office and great legislation. Um, I just wanted to ask a couple questions about a couple of loopholes, I think, in some uh, legislation that folks are working their way through. Uh, one is around the undergrounding plan for, uh, for PG&E and our utilities. Uh, I know the intention was that they would look for other sources to uh, fund those efforts, uh, but they are going directly to the ratepayers for that work um, and aren't, aren't really quantifying the short-term increased risk uh, from moving their focus away from covered conductors and sea hooks and other above ground infrastructure to the undergrounding effort. And while um, I agree that uh, long-term that's a great solution, in the short term we're gonna have some increased risk and be great to see some transparency around that. And the other sort of area um, that there is a loophole folks working their way through is around the fires uh, through the PG&E bankruptcy, uh, where as you know, folks are at 65% of their payout uh, have really banked on the made whole agreement that was committed to them. Um, and there are a whole bunch of folks uh, who are really benefiting from the position, the difficult position that wildfire survivors are in through our trust, making money off of our money. And uh, of course, we're also looking at that federal legislation to make sure that we're gonna have uh, the tax relief that we got in California that was fantastic. But um, you know, folks are really in, in dire straits counting on that money and just wanna understand how we're going to hold folks accountable to make sure that we're getting from that 65% to that 100% so that we can rebuild our houses. Thank you. No, thank you so much. I'm very grateful to Mr. Abrams and all of his work that he's been putting in. It has been an amazing job that he's uh, he's literally driving the Public Utilities Commission, advocating on behalf of fire survivors uh, and uh, working with leaders across the state. So thank you. So first and foremost, on the issue of undergrounding, it is a 10 year endeavor. Um, that is the the how PG&E will uh, complete those 10,000 miles. Uh, a recent rate case is in front of the Public Utilities Commission, even as we speak, to be able to become more aggressive, and I'll just use the term of insulating of lines, um, which I do believe uh, is absolutely critical and will be a stopgap until we see those 10,000 miles of line. And that's something that they're dealing with even as we speak. Uh, and I think they had their last conversation about that as a commission last week in regards to greater insulation of lines um, throughout the state, especially in those high fire threat zones. Um, on the settlement, look, uh, We've had many a conversation on this. I think that we're gonna to need to be able to have a greater conversation in the state on these settlement dollars, how they roll out, how the expectations are managed uh, in working with that administrator's office. Um, there's a bit of a mix, as you well know, and no better than I, between the Fed and the state government oversight. Uh, but look, there is, I think, significant rooms for improvement when it comes to transparency, uh, how payouts work, uh, and we need to standardize um, tax relief. So the state of California has not taxed those payouts. Um, when we've seen these settlements, uh, it has been a one-off. I do believe that it needs we need to have a standard policy in this state for these large settlements that uh, fire survivors can bank on, not having to pay stateside tax on those settlements. And I just don't know if the federal government will ever get there besides a one-off uh, approach for each disaster. And I'm incredibly grateful to Congressman Thompson, who's been leading the way on that, um, on a bipartisan approach to be able to end taxing of the settlements. But Mr. Abrams, you're absolutely right in there needs to be more work and that's something that we continue to work on uh, with the governor's office. Hey, hey, what's going on? Senator McGuire, thank you for being here today and for your comments and your work. Uh, we appreciate it. Jonathan Cusel, Sierra Institute for Community and Environment. We're based in Indian Valley, ground zero, the Dixie Fire. A couple comments. One, I hope when we talk about insurance, we think not only of home hardening and the benefits that are associated with that, but we think of building back fire resistant structures and ensuring opportunity for both insuring those uh, structures, especially if you start with the notion of building a hardened home 
There are ways of doing it. You can do even way better than just home hardening or, home hardening or retrofitting existing structures. Happy to talk about that more. We're doing that, in fact, in, in Indian Valley and in Greenville proper. Uh, secondly, the comment about bringing in contractors to do work quickly, excellent. But let me add one more thing to that. When we bring in outside contractors to do that work and assure that the quality of the work is really high, what happens sometimes is that the local contractors are left out. It is a way of rebuilding local capacity to use those contractors, many of whom have been put out of work as a result of catastrophic wildfire. So if there's ways of building in mechanisms to hire locally, utilize local businesses, it is a way of building capacity for truly after the fire. Couldn't agree with you. First, the, your last point. First, uh, there is a local hire provision within the state law that mandates, and, and I don't want to give you the exact percentage, I think it's 30%, but I, Jonathan, I'm happy to carry, we'll give you a card so we can follow up on uh, local hire from that impacted community. You're absolutely right. We've seen that in Mendocino County, Sonoma County, Lake County as well, um, on how important it is to be able to get folks back to work and those paychecks flowing. Um, on the issue of building back more resilient, what you just said, I would love to talk with you more about that. I love Greenville, I love Chester, um, whole Lake Almanor area, and um, I'm just being blunt about it. We need to ensure though, if a homeowner are, is advancing that, that they're gonna be able to access the traditional insurance market. And that has been the biggest issue. You can harden your home till the cows come home, and there is a high probability that they, if you live in a so-called high fire threat community, you may not get anything except for uh, high cost, uh, low return in regards to the fair plan. So I'm trusting, but we need to verify on this new executive action. And I think we're gonna need to be able to legislate if we're looking at a Greenville, for example, and they build back in a hard and more resilient way, then that community is gonna be able to buy off of the traditional insurance market. And that's what I'd love to talk further with you on um, because it's, it's a major priority for us. The last thing I'm gonna say, and this is gonna be probably some of the most unpopular about what I'm about to say, uh, is I think we also need to have a conversation about new development in the most extreme high fire threat zones. Uh, when it comes to multi-unit uh, development in this state, um, that is an incredibly difficult conversation to have, but we need to look at a program very similar to what FEMA launched decades ago in regards to flooding. If you see payouts over and over and over again in regards to dwellings, then the federal government would come in and be able to purchase that property. And that is an issue that we're gonna have to address uh, long-term in this state, especially for high-density uh, multifamily developments. Again, incredibly controversial, but uh, we need to start having that conversation in this state. Jonathan, uh, Carrie is going to give you a card, and I look forward to following up. And thank you so much for your work.